Hello Aviator, Sky here, and we continue the story of the Lockheed U-2. And while in the first part we got acquainted with the plane itself, now we will have a walk through its amazing world, filled with decades of successes and failures. We know why the Dragon Lady is good at what she does, it's time to find out why the Dragon Lady is legendary. By the time the tests were completed and the U-2 was accepted, the military and intelligence services were already prepared to use them. Plans for the placement of machines at airfields, lists of strategic objects that needed to be studied, and flight routes over them were developed. As a cover, a legend was invented. The aviators developed a special high-altitude aircraft for the study of atmospheric phenomena in the interests of NACA, the ancestor of NASA. Given the serious political factor and risks, the final decisions on the implementation of missions were usually made in the White House. The need for reconnaissance by then had become extremely high. In the mid-1950s, the Soviet strategic aviation was developing at a very high rate. The Piston 24, copies of the B-29, did not pose a critical threat to the United States, but the turboprop 295 and the Jet M4 that replaced them were already worrying. And the most worrying was the fact that their numbers were unknown, and the only way to find out was aerial reconnaissance. The first foreign mission of the U-2 took place already in 1956, when the group was deployed on the territory of the Federal Republic of Germany. Mission planning was carried out jointly by the Air Force and the CIA, and in some cases with the MI6. Yes, colleagues of Mr. Bond knew about the Dragon Lady program and actively participated in it, to the point that some of the flights were carried out by the pilots of the Royal Air Force. In the beginning, the scouts were careful. Work was carried out over the countries of Eastern Europe, and only after some time over the territory of the USSR. Soviet air defense forces tried to intercept the U-2, but could not reach it at high altitude. The Americans calmed down a little, having closed the issue of the number of bombers. There were only a few dozen M4s, not hundreds as the experts were concerned. There were also some unpleasant surprises. The Soviet air defenses could not shoot down the U-2, but their radars were pretty good and guided the intruder for most of the route. The CIA tried not to snoop in the USSR unnecessarily. They snooped in other countries. Another group was stationed in Turkey, from where the planes were watching the events in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. There was a lot going on there at that time. There was always a lot going on there. In parallel, the aviators were looking for ways to bypass the vigilant Soviet radars. One of them was the Rainbow Project, initiated by the CIA and Lockheed, aimed at reducing radar signature. The project worked out a fairly broad theoretical basis. Modifications to the design were assumed, the introduction of many elements, including rather exotic ones, and of course the use of radio-absorbing coatings. Not everything could be implemented on the U-2. Design changes reduced altitude and range, and the new coatings were worse at dissipating heat, which led to overheating of the systems. Some of the solutions nevertheless were implemented on airplanes and even tested in flights, but the effects were minimal and most of them were abandoned. Ironically, the U-2 did not become invisible, but from it, back in the late 1950s, appeared the seeds of what would later be called stealth technology. But the planes were still evolving. The U-2C received improved equipment, larger air intakes and the more powerful J-75 engines. The aircraft began to be painted in a signature dark blue, almost black color, making it difficult to see against the background of the dark sky. In addition, they received suspensions under the wing, which could contain both fuel and electronic reconnaissance equipment. These fairings were not suspended from pylons, but integrated directly into the lower half-plane of the wing, which allowed to lower the mass. A similar solution can be seen on the first Jetstar business jet, also created at Lockheed, also by Kelly Johnson. Flights to the USSR intensified again in 1957 from airfields in Alaska and Pakistan. Of particular interest was Kazakhstan, where the CIA monitored nuclear test sites and looked for facilities where work on the missile program was carried out. Those who look will always find. The U-2 were able to find a complex located near the village of Tyuratam. That was the first sighting of the Baikonur Cosmodrome. On 
On October 4, 1957, for the first time in history the famous beeps, short signals from the first artificial satellite, went to Earth from orbit. This caused both the delight in the scientific community and shock in the military and political structures. The frightening of course was not the satellite itself, but the carrier that lifted it into orbit. The appearance of intercontinental ballistic missiles gave the USSR an advantage. They could reach the territory of the United States and it was practically impossible to intercept them. Moreover, like with bombers earlier, fear was also raised by the fact that it was unknown how many of these rockets were in service. The leading role in determining the level of development of the Soviet rocket industry was once again taken up by the U-2s. But even here not everything was easy. Missiles were becoming more and more effective not only in the delivery of nuclear weapons, but also in air defense. The high altitude scouts were out of reach of artillery and fighters, but what to do with the missiles was not clear. They had to take a risk and the planes still began to carry out reconnaissance flights, for a long time quite successful. The threat from this only grew. Several years of successful operations with a huge amount of useful data slightly dulled the vigilance of strategists. And this is a very bad thing. In the spring of 1960 it was planned to carry out several difficult missions over the territory of the USSR on the U-2 aircraft. The first one was implemented in April. The plane took off from a base in Pakistan, flew over several strategic objects in the south of the country and went to Iran. The CIA underestimated the factor of luck and began to implement the second, even more ambitious one. This time the U-2 was supposed to fly out of Pakistan, cross the territory of the USSR and land in Norway, filming many objects on the way. One of the most experienced U-2 pilots, Francis Gary Powers, was assigned to fly the aircraft. Initially, the flight was planned for the end of April, but due to delays it was shifted to May 1st. On this account, many theories have arisen as to why it was necessary to perform such a flight on the International Workers' Day, very important in the Soviet Union, from special tasks and suitable weather conditions to ordinary politics. But technically, this date was as unfortunate as possible. The air traffic was less dense and it was easier to track the plane on radars. And that's what happened. The Soviet air defense forces saw the U-2 almost immediately and began attempts to intercept it. The dance with the Dragon Lady lasted for several hours, until in the sky over Sverdlovsk, fortune turned away from powers. The plane was fired at with missiles from the SA-2 guideline air defense systems and one of them hit the target. The warhead of the missile exploded behind the aircraft and the shockwave along with the striking elements caught the tail, engine and the wing. The damage was lethal. The plane immediately began an uncontrolled fall, collapsing more and more at the same time. The cockpit was also damaged and the pilot had to get out on his own. The mangled U-2 crashed into a field southeast of Sverdlovsk. The air defense forces did not immediately identify the falling aircraft, mistaking the signals for jamming. They continued firing, which led to an accidental attack of two of their own MiG-19 fighters, which also flew to intercept. One plane was shot down, the pilot was killed. All U-2 flights were stopped immediately. However, there was no panic in the CIA. They assumed that the plane shot down by a missile would be completely destroyed if it fell from an altitude of over 70,000 feet and the pilot had no chance of surviving. The situation is cynically unpleasant, but no serious consequences were expected. The US official authorities presented a pre-prepared story that a NASA high altitude aircraft performing a research flight over Turkey went missing. Maybe the pilot lost consciousness and the plane simply drifted in Soviet airspace. Nikita Khrushchev, being a fan of vivid performances, for several days continued to provoke the Americans to publish more and more data on a drifting NASA aircraft and only on May 7th officially presented the results of the hunt for the U-2. As it turned out, although the plane fell from a great height, it did not gain a very high vertical speed and was not completely destroyed by hitting the ground. Soviet engineers collected the wreckage and managed to restore some of the structures for a more detailed study and public demonstration. And so the U-2, from the most secret spy, became the most famous. The second and also the main thing, Francis Gary Powers is alive. The whole story about the NASA plane is nothing more than a fairy tale with a rather mediocre plot. 
Eisenhower was in a very ugly position. The round was definitely won by Khrushchev. Powers was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but in February 1962 he was exchanged for a Soviet intelligence agent Rudolf Abel. The history of U-2 flights over the territory of the USSR and, in general, flights of the American reconnaissance aircraft over the USSR was over. Now this work had been transferred to satellites. It was a step forward in terms of surveillance security, but a step back in terms of quality. The Corona satellites in use at that time gave an image with a resolution of the ground almost 10 times worse than the U-2. Created in the mid-1950s, the U-2 performed a series of successful reconnaissance flights, then was shut down and, with a scandal, ceased to perform its main task. One would think that this was the end of its career, but no. Operations in the skies of the USSR were discontinued, but luckily for the CIA and the Air Force, not everyone could boast of such an air defense system like Moscow. To increase the range of flights from the United States territory, Lockheed upgraded the aircraft to the U-2F version, with the ability to refuel in the air. Now the range was limited not so much by the supply of fuel as by the fatigue of the pilots. More than 10 hours of flight at an altitude of 20 kilometers became outright torture. However, with these improvements, the U-2 quickly resumed operations in different regions of the world. In 1962, reconnaissance missions over Cuba uncovered another big surprise for the White House. Soviet military equipment, aircraft, specialists and, most importantly, medium-range missiles with nuclear warheads were discovered on the island. Thus began the most dangerous episode of the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis. While the military were preparing for a head-on confrontation and politicians were looking for ways not to make 1962 the last year in human history, the U-2 actively explored Cuba, flying over it several times a day. They flew until the next meeting with their blood enemy, the SA-2. Another missile shot down another spy plane, this time killing the pilot. Fortunately, ballistic missiles did not fly over Cuba. The war was avoided. In parallel, the U-2s continued to operate actively in Asia, stationed at Allied bases. Given the size of the Asia-Pacific region, the aviators began to have ideas for adapting the aircraft for sea-based operation. This is how the carrier-based U-2G was created. The aircraft turned out to be surprisingly adaptable for the conditions of the aircraft carrier, but in practice it was too complicated in operation. There is evidence of only two missions carried out from ships, both times in mid-1964, when the spy planes watched the preparation of test sites in Polynesia, where over the next 10 years, France conducted several dozen nuclear bomb tests of their own. Yes, those were the fun times. Of course, the U-2s were active in Taiwan as well. A special squadron was formed there, named Black Cat Squadron. Subordinate to the CIA and the island's authorities, it was manned by pilots from both countries. The main task was to monitor facilities in China, with additional work in other neighboring countries. They also had losses. In fact, the Chinese shot down as many as five aircraft during the 1960s, however using once again the Soviet-designed air defense systems, mainly the same SA-2. Guideline and the Dragon Lady. Eternal competitors, really. Over time, as relations between the United States and the People's Republic of China warmed up, the passion for spy games calmed down. Officially, the U-2 reconnaissance flights from Taiwan were terminated in 1974. Around the same time, the CIA finally handed the program over to the Air Force. In the late 1960s, Lockheed carried out a large-scale modernization of the aircraft, creating the U-2R version. It was to a large extent a new aircraft. It received many design changes, including a longer fuselage and increased wingspan, as well as large instrument base in the fairings on the wing. The planes almost doubled their weight, from 10 to 18 tons, were much more efficient and, importantly, more comfortable to operate. In the early 1980s, on the basis of the U-2R, the Tactical Reconnaissance TR-1 version was created and was used mainly in Europe from air bases in the United Kingdom. 
They continue to be used in reconnaissance operations in different regions, already in a more relaxed mode, without too much excitement. It was not a bad division of roles between the U-2 and its successor, the SR-71 Blackbird. The super-fast reconnaissance aircraft, capable of flying at Mach 3 at altitudes up to 25-26 km or 85,000 feet, surpassed its ancestor in all respects, including cost. Its use was monstrously expensive. Yes, from a technical point of view, compared to Blackbird, the Dragon Lady, let's be honest, seems like a bicycle. But this bicycle was much cheaper and was presented as a cheap option. The plane could not be put on dangerous missions in areas of active anti-air defense, but it did well in most common tasks. Besides, in addition to strategic reconnaissance, it also engaged in tactical. For example, monitoring combat zones in real time. This fact, by the way, still remains the answer to the question, why U-2 if there are satellites? With all their bonuses, most satellites, due to the nuances of orbital dynamics, cannot constantly cycle over one place, but an airplane can. A striking example of their relevance comes from the statistics provided by the results of Operation Desert Storm in Iraq in 1990-1991. For six weeks of active hostilities, the U-2 group performed 260 flights, spending more than 2,000 hours in the sky. These aircraft provided up to 90% of reconnaissance data for the Army in real time, up to 50% of all aerial photography, and in total, about a third of all reconnaissance in the combat zone. Yes, a good portion of the trendy satellite photos were not taken from satellites at all. The combination of simplicity, low cost of operation and flexibility became the key to longevity for the U-2. The aircraft continued to be modified and improved. The U-2S appeared with a GE-118 engine and again improved equipment. It was also an advantage. The reconnaissance complex is modular. The devices can be easily changed depending on the tasks without modifying at the same time the design and systems of the aircraft. The biggest external innovation in the following years was the appearance of a large dorsal fairing, inside which satellite communication systems, the so-called span-spur blocks, were installed. High-speed communication made it possible to control all reconnaissance equipment remotely from the base. Interestingly, the initially mostly fake service in the interest of NASA became a very practical area of work for the U-2. Spy equipment gave way to sensors and telescopes. The aircraft have found application in a variety of civilian missions, the goal of which were both the study of the Earth and the planet's atmosphere, as well as space observations. Such efficiency and versatility ensured the aircraft a long service life. The U-2 outlived its successor. The SR-71 was decommissioned in the late 1990s, and the Dragon Lady does not even think about retirement. And this is despite the fact that talks about replacing the outdated spy planes with the latest drones have been going on since the early 2000s. At least for this, the RQ-4 Global Hawk from Northrop Grumman was made. But no one's in a hurry to replace the plane. About three dozen U-2s are still flying in the Air Force. Not too shabby, given that just over a hundred of them were built. At the same time, working together with drones, the U-2 does not seem outdated at all, showing excellent performance and reconnaissance capabilities. The superiority of the Global Hawk is obvious only in duration and range of the flight. No man, no problem. But this bonus so far is offset by a rather high cost of use. In view of this fact, military and political disputes about the Dragon Lady program continue, and Lockheed Martin plays along, stating that with normal maintenance and modernization, the U-2 can safely fly for another couple of decades. The longevity of the temporary spy plane, created in nine months, turned out to be a record. It cuts through the dark blue sky for more than 60 years. Few aircraft can boast such experience, and such, with your permission, a life full of adventures. In terms of service life, the U-2 in the United States competes perhaps with the B-52. And that's it. The Dragon Lady continues to serve, and it's time for Skyships to finish up her story. I look forward to your enthusiastic and angry comments, and of course, likes. And if you want to watch the videos earlier, get exclusives, or just support the channel, visit our Patreon page. Fly high, and don't forget to take pictures of the views from the window. Fast flights and soft landings to you.